Hey everybody, welcome back to another Journey on the Fly, the podcast where we talk about life and fly fishing. So, this week I'm going to continue my little um, venture into winter tactics because I think it's really important. So last week we talked about, well, go listen to last week's because it's really, really important. As a matter of fact, that before you go out and fish in the winter time, listen to last week's episode. Share it, please. Um, I think it's just important. Whether it helps me or not, I think it will help you. Or if you know that guy that doesn't wear his harness on the tree stand, he's probably the guy that might not dress appropriately or do what is necessary to be safe in the winter. Share the podcast, please. So, speaking to the podcast, not only are we a podcast, but we are also a full-service fly fishing guide for central Pennsylvania and southwestern Pennsylvania, or western Pennsylvania for that matter. We are not afraid to hit stock trout streams. We are not afraid and love to hit the wild streams. And uh, just took a great two guys out, a father and son, about a week ago, and it was a fantastic time. Little 10-year-old kid, um, sweet, awesome kid, um, very attentive, very intelligent, uh, listened to instruction really well, caught his first wild trout, his first trout ever with his dad. They could not have been happier. And I tell you, it's an honor to have been part of that process and to have helped that all come together for both of them. But also the podcast itself is found on everywhere podcasts are found, as far as I know, uh, from iTunes to Google Play to Spotify to uh, iHeartRadio to our website, journeyonthefly.fish. So check it out. Uh, This week, we're talking about tactics, and we're going to start now from the trout's perspective, and then we're going to move into water, and then we're going to move into fly selection And then we're going to talk about maybe rigging and things. What might be different in the wintertime to try to apply. And we'll look at that from a a, a tight lining perspective. But we'll also look at that from uh, a standard gear perspective as well. Because not everybody likes to go out with a mono rig. Um, I think they're versatile. I I think, in my opinion, I will rarely ever use anything different until I'm casting long distances. And I do not mean to say that as a diss to one or the other. It's fishing, let's get out, let's get our lines wet, get our flies in the fish's mouth, and just have fun. Let's not be that dry or die or that nymph maniac. Let's be fly fishermen, right? So what does winter fishing look like for the trout? So let's think of the trout in the terms as it is. It's a a designed being that uh, has a what we call, um, they have lateral lines, which they feel reverberations in the water. Um, they see mono, uh, they see from a uh, bino- binocular and a monocular way. Um, so they see out of one eye and they see out of both eyes. They are cold-blooded, which is a really important topic we're going to talk about here because that means the temperature of their environment is what essentially dictates kind of symbiotically their movement in the water and the water column and the different types of currents and then the different depths of the different times of year based on that temperature. Uh, Temperature isn't everything, but temperature is incredibly important. They have ranges where they begin to move out to different parts of the water. That's why when I know the water is starting to possibly be in the 40s or higher, the very second thing I do when I enter a stream is take a temperature because it will tell me where those trout most likely are in the column and in the different water types. It's so important to to have a thermometer on you and take it. It's not just a techie thing. It's a functional fly fishing advantage to, to take those temperatures. Unless you're a guy that just has a calibrated finger and you can dip your finger in the water and know what temperature it is. But nevertheless. So speaking the wintertime, we're not going to talk about spring or summer heat, but in the wintertime when temperatures are dropping into the low 40s and so forth, and really even into the low 50s and the 40s and obviously the 30s, the fishing the, the, the fish slow down. They, they literally pump the brakes because they are designed in such a way that if they continue to expel energy in the cold, they cannot reproduce it uh, enough and it will kill them. It will essentially give them a type of cardiac arrest 
as far as I understand. So what that does for us as the fishermen, it tells us where they're going to be and it tells us when they'll be feeding. Because not only do trout um, react to temperature, so do the bugs. And as the temperature of the water begins to rise, bug activity goes up. Midges are the number one biomass found in creeks and rivers <coughs> all the time of year. Uh, well, we'll say different times of year. They can actually range in broods of 800 to upwards of <clears throat> 2,000 larvae per square meter in certain creeks. Now, not every creek here in western Pennsylvania produces that, but on a lot of the better creeks that you'll see that. Mitches uh, survive in low oxygenated water, which means you're not going to be in runs and riffles as much, which means also, interesting enough, here's that symbiotic relationship that I refuse to overlook as something beyond just an accident, and that is the low oxygenated water, as all of you are probably thinking, is the winter water. It's that slow water. It's the water that doesn't turn and boil from uh, riffles and, and substrate flowing over it at shallow depths. It's not even necessarily your runs. It's those slow poles. It's those deep poles. And interesting enough, they find their way into the substrate, into the mud and the, and, and the uh, um, silt and so forth. And a lot of times you'll see these critters at the bottom when you pick up a rock, if you get, get that deep, there'll be a blood red color. Well, they're blood red because that's the hemoglobin in their system that is producing oxygen for them, hence why they can survive in that. But here's the interesting symbiotic relationship I'm talking about. That's where the trout are. The trout are in that slower water most of the day when the temperatures are really a sub, I will say mid 40s and below is when you really begin to see them um, in, in that slower water. But definitely when the water is in uh, low 40s uh, and, and 30s and so forth, they're just not moving much. Now, what it doesn't mean is that trout are not, um, they're not hibernating necessarily. I mean, they are in a sense where they're, 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 um, um, resisting uh, caloric burning, but they are not hibernating in the sense that they're just sleeping because trout don't sleep. If trout sleep, they don't have, uh, in a sense, a control in, instinctively or whatever of their system, and they would just float away to their death. <coughs> and I apologize for the coughing and the cruddy sound and voice. Um, I'm just getting over being uh, sick for like three weeks, actually going on four now. Nevertheless, so you have these bugs in this low oxygenated, slower moving water, and you now have trout that are comfortably suited and sitting in this water. And as the day progresses and the sun hits the water, if it's a decent day, bug activity moves, trout warm up a little bit, and trout begin to move. So it's as if there's a window, say uh, a good window would be like 11 to 3 in the afternoon, of fishing when the sun's hitting the water the bugs are moving and the fish are but more active so it's almost as if we have a dinner bell or rather a, a, an alarm clock or a time that we know we can be in the water the fishing is going to be the most productive now that's not to say you're not going to catch a crazy trout in another period of time but consistently this is when you want to be in the water and this is why you want to be in the water at those times but here's the deal with the first, this, this is why what I said first, other than just your safety and my care for you on the first podcast in this winter tactics series is so important. It's because you're going to probably be in that slow, deeper water, which means you're going to expel, expend, excuse me, more of your calories, but more of your body heat is going to be sucked out of you in a sense from that freezing water. So I want you to spend as little time in there as necessary um, as far as active times at going after fish, but you have a window to do it. You have a, that window of a, that 11 to three window or so, unless you got a day that you think it's going to warm up uh, sooner or whatever. But then there's other days that are interesting in the winter, like this coming Thursday, we're, we got temperatures going into the 52, I think, but there's rain coming. The rain is probably going to be uh, warmer than the water temperature. So the water temperature will rise just a little bit because of the rain hitting it and the temperature. What a great time to be out there. Uh, yeah, it's a challenge to be out in the wintertime and be wet, 
But man, if you if you follow some of my safety procedures and you have good wa- wa- uh, waiting gear, man, that would be an awesome day. Just one of those days that makes you feel like a a real fisher fisher fly fisher, right? You know, you're you're adoring it all uh, except for the cold because it's going to be fifty two. But anyways, you follow me. So I want you to think that in summary. Bugs are active when the water warms up. The bugs that are predominant in the water are midges. Now, that's not the only thing that will be in the water. You're going to start to see betas here in a couple weeks. You're going to start to see maybe even some blue wings pop. Um, Even on some of the streams that I've been on lately, we've seen some of those small black stone flies come out. So they're in there, but they're in there and they're moving and they're active when the water temperatures begin to rise. Almost um, in correlation with the water temperature moving the fish around um, some. So you, you're going to be in that same water type that the food is in and that therefore the trout are in because trout are expending less energy in less hydraulic pressured water. So less oxygenated water, slower, slow, slower moving water equals trout habitat equals food. Get in there and catch these fish. Man, and if you're doing this, if you if you hear what I'm, um, I'm dropping, picking up what I'm dropping, as they say, the youngsters... Send me some photos, man. Tag me. You know, uh, it's actually journey underscore on the underscore fly on Instagram. I want to see these pictures of these winter trout that you're catching. Uh, it's been a different winter for us right now because we haven't had really a winter except for the like the deep freeze we had around Christmas time. So it's been a pretty awesome, almost an extended fall, if you will, um, as far as trout goes uh, and winter fishing. We've had it pretty good as far as things go, unless you're fishing Erie where it's cold no matter what. Um, want to do something different for the next, uh, for, for, so I'm going to do one on kind of fly selection and then a little tactics on maybe different gear or something for the, um, uh, winter coming up or for winter fishing. Jeez, get it out, dude. But after that, I want to do something really cool. So my email, get a pen or pencil. My email is adam at journey on the fly dot fish that's adam at journey on the fly dot fish if you would like to be part of this podcast we could get like maybe four or five of you all in men women kids i don't care let's talk winter fly fishing i want to hear your tactics and your ideas i want to hear things maybe you figured out that we haven't things that may have worked for a period or stopped working or maybe you had a great winter fishing experience with throwing big streamers i don't know and i don't care where you are in the country if you're listening to this i want to hear from you i thought it'd be cool we'll do a i'll put a zoom together we can uh just call them we'll just do voice and i'll bring you all in and kind of record it all together and uh maybe you just have some really cool winter fishing stories that with family or friends or with your wife or your husband. I mean, I'd love to hear them. I'd love for you to share them with the rest of us. Um, so reach out to me, Adam at journey on the fly dot fish. Um, and it'll be a couple weeks before we do it. So we can kind of plan it and set it up. And we'll do it for like an hour and chat about it because, um, I'm sure you just all love hearing my voice only. I'm just kidding. Um, I have things to say and I enjoy saying them, but I can do that somewhere else. So I take some time to do these monologues like this for everybody when I have some information to share. But we have some good guests coming. Uh, One of them uh, had some family issues tonight um, that we're praying for. And uh, we have a great guest I'm recording with this Wednesday evening. And some other ones lined up in the political world where it affects our fly fishing and our conservation. Um, And talking to some more artists and uh, just biologists and entomologists. I mean, we're, we've got some pretty cool, exciting stuff coming up. So stay in tune, share this podcast, let us know what you think. Um, got any more ideas for guests? Let us know that too. I'd like to reach out. Some of you have reached out. Some of you have given us great ideas and some of you are going to actually be our guests. So Adam at journey on a fly dot fish till the next time, friends, keep your lines wet and your flies in the fish's mouth. God bless.